first, let's talk about the song. It is called Ska Surf. It is from the Venezuelan surf band, Los Javelin. And the reason I'm playing it on this week's episode of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear, that would be Monster Kid Radio. Well, there's a very specific reason for that. The last time we played this band here on the show was back in August of 2018. Remember that date. My name is Derek M. Cook. I'd like to welcome you to the show. I'm the writer, host, producer, and everything else around here. And uh, I'm excited for this week's episode. Now, before we get into it, I'm going to ask you to cast your mind back. I'm going to take you on a little trip. Here's the thing. Monster Kid Radio is not my only podcast. I mean, it's my only podcast that I do now, but I've got a lot of other podcasts uh, in my past, one of them being Mail or Zombie, of course. And then there was the show 1951 Down Place that I co-produced with Scott Morris and Casey Criswell. It ran from September of 2011. Uh, The final episode went out in March of 2018. And over the years, I've teased a little bit about how we're going to bring it back. We might do it again. We might do it again. That sort of thing. It just has never happened. Now, here's the thing. Towards the end of the run of 1951 Down Place, there's an episode, and I don't think we ever aired it, but there was an episode where Scott and Casey and I were recording, we were talking, and Casey had to abruptly leave because he was passing a kidney stone, Um, (laughs) which is unfortunate. I I shouldn't laugh. I know that hurts. Not that I've had many, but I, I think I have, I mean, I've got one, I've had one. Um, but yeah, this this I feel terrible. And then eventually Casey had to move on. You know, he had to leave the show for whatever reason. And then that's fine. Casey and I and Scott were all still friends and all that, so no big deal. But there was a joke that we started running, uh, or that we were going to run with, that Casey had been replaced with Casey's kidney stone. Why do I bring that up? Because you're going to hear it in this week's episode of Monster Kid Radio. I am digging into the past, and I am finding an episode that we never put out that I never edited. It was recorded back in August of 2018. It's about the movie Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. And we're going to run that this week on Monster Kid Radio. Now, a couple of things about 1951 Down Place. It is a Hammer Films podcast. And sometimes the Hammer Films, especially the Hammer Films of the 1970s, can get a little saucy. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go into the conversation about the movie. Scott and I don't get very saucy, but... Like when we play the trailer for the film, you know, it, it deals with some themes and such that we don't normally talk about on MKR very often. So know that going into it. Also, one of the things that we used to do on 1951 Down Place is we would try to find connections between Hammer Films and some of Scott's favorite film franchises or, or media empires. So you're going to hear a James Bond connection segment where Scott connects Dr. Jekyll and Stride to some James Bond movies. You're also going to hear a Disney connection section where he connects this film to some Disney properties. And back then, Don Falcos was always sending in a Doctor Who connection. So you're going to hear from Don Falcos as well. As an aside, Don, I saw your post on Facebook. My condolences, my friend. So you're going to hear all of that. You're going to hear the regular conversation that Scott and I would have had on 1951 Down Place. I had a good time with it. You know, going back, revisiting that and editing it and that sort of thing. It was it was fun to kind of go back and, and listen to a conversation that I had with one of my closest friends about a film that, you know, over the years has slowly crept up the list on my list of preferred Hammer films. It's not as high as it ended up on Scott's list, but I don't necessarily want to uh, spoil any part of the episode. If you're interested in any episodes of 1951 Down Place, they're still online, and the website's still up even. 1951downplace.com So go check that out when you're done if you want more 1951 Down Place Hammer Film goodness. Also this week, Kenny's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. He is able to tie it into the film this week, so we're going to have that, plus we have the Beta Capsule Review from Mark Matsky that has absolutely nothing to do with Hammer Films, go figure. And I tried. I tried. I spent so much time on the Internet Movie Database trying to find a way to link this particular episode of Ultraman to Hammer, and there's just no way. I tried, man. I tried. Anyway, you're going to get all of that this week on the show. By the way, you're going to hear this song by Los Chevaline at the end of the episode without me talking over it. 
You can find them over on Facebook and their albums are available through the Green Cookie Bandcamp page at greencookierecords.bandcamp.com. As always, I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes. Let's get on with the show. I am Dr. Lee Cushing. Welcome to my Chamber of Horrors. Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors is a monster rally novel in the tradition of the classic Universal and Hammer horror film. It's written by Stephen D. Sullivan, the award-winning author of White Zombie, Daikaiju Attack, Manos the Hands of Fate, and one of the creators of the original chill role-playing game. This book recreates the thrills of the classic monster vs. monster film. We've got vampires, werewolves, mummies, psychic twins, scheming madmen, and plenty of unexpected chills. Now you can get Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors in print, or for Kindle at Amazon.com and other fine retailers. Coming soon in other ebook formats. Find out more at CushingHorrors.com or SDSullivan.com, and support Steve's work through Patreon at HeySteve.com. I do hope you've enjoyed your visit. Please come again, and remember, the chamber is always waiting for its next victim. Why, hey, 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 what are you looking for under a tombstone in broad daylight? Shh, you'll scare her away. Scare her away? Who? What? What, what? what can you scare away here in a cemetery? My ghoul friend. She's the ghost in the invisible bikini. <laughs> what are you putting me on? Herbie, I know you're broad-minded, but this is ridiculous. No, I'm serious. And you should see her since she traded her bedsheet for a bikini. Well, you must enjoy looking around for a real nothing broad. It's really just that American International is inviting everyone out to the graveyard for a blood-curdling blast with the ghost in the invisible bikini to see Tommy Kirk, Deborah Wally, Aaron Kincaid, Harvey Lembeck, and Jesse White with Nancy Sinatra, and guest stars Basil Rathbone, Boris Karloff, and Susan Hart in the ghost in the invisible bikini in Path A Color and Panavision. Now, you would have to get commercial. Now, you scared her away. <laughs> They came from another planet to destroy the Earth. Giant spiders, 30 feet tall, clawing, crushing, killing everything in their paths. Never before was anything like them seen on Earth. The government and the military were in shock. Could anyone stop them? Could anyone stop the giant spider invasion? Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. My home is Earth. That's the enigmatic title of the 23rd episode of Ultraman. Disaster strikes Tokyo as an international peace conference prepares to convene. Planes, boats, and cars and their occupants are being destroyed when they crash into an invisible wall of unknown origin. With the help of Paris headquarters member Allen, the Science Patrol investigates the most recent accident and identify an invisible rocket as the source of the unseen barrier. Ide labors through the night to invent a series of rays that will make the spacecraft visible, which are employed successfully, and the Science Patrol forces the saucer to crash land. A giant monster emerges from the fiery explosion whom Alan appears to recognize, calling out the name Jamila. Before nightfall, the creature eludes capture and goes into hiding, and Alan reveals that Jamila had once been a human astronaut whose mission went awry, and his exposure to the forces of space altered his physical chemistry into monstrous form. Hearing this, Ide has a crisis of conscience, refusing to fight Jamila. But the orders from Paris headquarters are uncompromising. Jamila must be eliminated for the sake of the peace conference. The next day, when Jamila begins setting villages ablaze, Hayata knows what he must do, transforming into Ultraman after saving a young boy and his favorite pigeon. 
My Home is Earth, is a remarkable episode in that it explores some rather mature themes with very little in the way of comic relief to ease the tension. For a show typically aimed at children, the last few minutes of the episode are particularly heavy. Jamila's demise at the hands of Ultraman is heartbreaking, and Ide's final lines of dialogue are truly haunting. Credit goes to writer Mamoru Sasaki, who was responsible for some of Ultraman's most offbeat and memorable scripts, such as last week's Overthrow the Surface, terrifying cosmic rays in which the schoolboy's kaiju drawing comes to life, and the upcoming Monster Graveyard, a very significant story featuring melancholy monster Sibozu. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. I know I don't always pop in at the end of the beta capsule reviews, but I really wanted to this time around because this is actually one of my favorite episodes. It's really good. I know that Ultraman was skewed toward uh, a younger audience than, say, Ultra Q. And over the years, you can see that, especially now. I'm not saying that it makes it less enjoyable, but, you know, the, the target audience, the demographic definitely skews younger than a lot of media that you would normally associate with me. But this one does deal with some pretty heavy things and there's some really solid performances and I really enjoy it. Also, I just wanted to give a shout out to any particular fans of, and I mispronounce this name every time I try to say it, so I apologize, Messiah Nihai. He played Ide in this particular episode and he actually just passed away last month. So just want to give a little bit of recognition to that. Mark, once again, thank you so much for all of your hard work with the Beta Capsule Review. You know what? We ought to have like an ultra mark, an ultra man mark. That's what, that's really what we need to come up with. One million years BC erupts on the screen with volcanic excitement. One million years BC when the earth parted and the mountains fell. Primitive man and monstrous beasts fought each other to inherit the earth. Since time began, has the primitive scene been captured for the screen with such imaginative realism? Ah! Behold man one million years B.C. Nightmare terror from the tomb. An ancient curse comes to life to strangle the living and raise the dead. Here is the horror and the terror of a story that began in ancient Egypt. Take Kato Bey! Take him! When Kato Bey, a son of Pharaoh, died in the desert and was covered in the shroud that bore the sacred power of life and death. What was he saying? He says that death awaits all who disturb the resting place of Kato Bay. Warning to every creature of flesh and blood, beware the beat of the cloth-wrapped feet. Beware the curse of the mummy's shroud. This is the leader of the British expedition who came in search of the tomb. The rich and ruthless financier who believes money can bribe even the devil himself. This is the son who knows there is no escape. Someone or, or something is trying to destroy us. I believe it'll find us wherever we go. Hello. 
Hello everyone, I'm famous monster hunter Ash Williams and I'm here today representing Fiend, finding individual eyesores new dwellings. Sometimes monster hunters make the mistake of capturing a monster instead of destroying it, well, not me, but others. When that happens, the good folks at Fiend step in and help to find homes for these poor unfortunate souls. Currently Fiend is looking for homes for an iron monster, a crimson ghost, Bertha Turtle, a plague dock and that intergalactic troublemaker Droppo. If you would like to adopt your choice of one of these eyesores, all you need to do is purchase a coffee at ko-fi.com slash monster kid radio. Each $3 coffee you purchase will get you one entry into a drawing to win your choice of one of these characters. These figures were designed and handmade by Tracy of the Disney, Indiana podcast, the sole proprietor of Stuff with Character, where you can find your favorite fandom friends in cuddly fleece form. You can learn more at facebook.com slash stuff with character. The winning entry will be announced during the intermission of the Monster Kid Movie Club stream on September 11th. Please help Fiend get these creatures off the street. Hello there Monster Kid Radioheads, this is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. Today Derek and his guests are talking about the Hammer 70s classic, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. This film was previewed in Famous Monsters 94 from November of 1972 which was my first FM purchased when I was eight years old. It was an eight page article with 11 photos. It started with these comments. Is the face familiar? Do you feel like you've seen him before? Well, you very likely have and will again, if you're a horror fan. Try Taste the Blood of Dracula for openers. In Chris Lee's Chris Lee vampire pick, young Bates was cast in the role of the despotic young aristocrat. Remember? Subsequently, he's been seen in Lust for a Vampire and the title role in Horror of Frankenstein. Now Bates joins the greats, Barrymore, Sheldon Lewis, Spencer Tracy, Jack Palance, and of course Frederick March in the Academy Award winning performance as Robert Louis Stevenson's durable dual personality. Remember the Avengers? the popular TV series? Since its inception in 1964, a pair of producers helmed it through its years of successful episodes. That team was Fennell and Clemens, and they have combined their talents again in the production of Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. Clemens is particularly qualified for the collaboration, having made his mark as a writer of the macabre when he scripted the best TV thriller of 1962, for which he won the Edgar Allan Poe Award. The article also included a long speech from the Frederick March version of Dr. Jekyll and a detailed spoiler-filled synopsis. Let's hear a highlight. The young doctor, nothing daunted and ever daring, risks himself as his first human guinea pig. He drinks the potent potion. Does it paralyze him? Poison him? Alter him? Change him? Make him feel differently? It changes him, all right. His voice, his looks, his personality. He looks into the mirror mirror on the wall and, most amazing revelation of all, discovers he has been changed into a woman, a young, beautiful woman. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more soon. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. Kenny, I had to know. You said this was the very first Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine that you purchased, so I had to know. And I went and I looked, and I saw what the cover was. So the cover has nothing to do with Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. It's actually a really cool Frankenstein cover, Frankenstein monster cover. And then I went and I flipped through some of the pages. I have a way to view some old issues of Famous Monsters. And I was real curious, because this film does have some sauciness in it, as I said at the very beginning. I was wondering what kind of pictures an eight-year-old Kenny was exposed to back then. And uh, nothing too too graphic, 
There is some gruesome, though. It's all in black and white, and I don't know if that makes it even worse or better, but I dig it. I can see why this is one you would have grabbed off the shelf, and I can see why this would have turned you into a fan of Famous Monsters of Filmland. Thanks again, Kenny, for all of your hard work. Buried alive in each man is a strange, depraved creature that turns the soul into a battleground of sin and violence, turning life into an inferno. In Dr. Henry Jeffers is this knowledge. Perhaps it was his quiet ways, his unloving wife, his simple, homely face that drove him to unleash this inner presence. This was Jekyll's inferno. Dr. Jekyll gave life to the unspeakable evil of Mr. Hyde. Rich, handsome, decadent Mr. Hyde erupted to spew adultery, viciousness, murder in the greatest macabre spectacle of all time. American International Pictures presents a fascinating new Dr. Jekyll, a terrifying new Mr. Hyde, Robert Louis Stevenson's study in terrifying evil, Jekyll's Inferno, in color and megascope. Dracula has risen from the grave. Boy, does he give a hickey. See the top double thrill, double chill motion picture program of the year. Curse of the Werewolf, in color, the harrowing story of the legendary half-man, half-wolf. His evil beast blood demanded he kill, kill, kill. Plus, the shadow of the cat, a shocking adventure into murder and psychotic fear. Two terrifying hits together. Don't miss them. This is Count Vlad, but you may recognize me by my more familiar name, Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. In your parlance, you might call these revelations spoilers. You know how the children of the night Ah, I mean monster kids can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned, and don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. Despite what Joe Dante will tell you in the Trailers from Hell episode covering the trailer from this month's movie, I guess this quarter's movie here on 1951 Down Place, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde is not the only transgender Jekyll and Hyde story, but it very well may be the first. We're going to be talking about that this week, not this month, this quarter. Man, you're on, Mo- on Monster Kid Ra- on Down Place. Man, it's a good thing I'm editing this week, month, quarter. <laughs> I swear I'm not doing this on purpose. This is 1951 Down Place. Who are you? <laughs> this is Casey's Kidney Stone. And boy, Derek, you seem to be having a tough time starting this episode out. I I am having a tough time, Casey's Kidney Stone. <laughs> How about you, Scott? How are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay. Maybe not as lively as Casey's Kidney Stone, but um, I'm here um, looking forward to talking about uh, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde from 1971, a movie that actually... One of the interesting things that I found out was released on my third birthday in the UK, November 7th, 1971. (laughs) Happy birthday, Scott. (laughs) This is what Hammer got me for my third birthday. Right. That's pretty awesome. (laughs) Nice of them to give you full frontal Martine Beswick. Um, (laughs) Anyway... (laughs) I guess it's not full frontal. I guess it I didn't must go have been a really good boy that year. <laughs> wow, man! This this oh, was this show going downhill already? Already, like already. Always, not, I mean, still, come on. <laughs> still. Oh, um, <laughs> how are you, man? Oh, I'm doing okay. Been a little busy, life getting in the way, that kind of fun stuff. But I'm ready to talk about this movie that uh, I had a chance to see for the very first time uh, just the other night. Even though this was my pick for a movie after we watched Taste the Blood of Dracula and I was uh, introduced to Ralph Bates, one of the first movies I'd seen him in, I wanted to see more of him. So that's why I picked this movie. Didn't we do Horror of Frankenstein? We did. And I don't remember him being in it that much. Maybe I would kind of block that movie out 
Yeah, so, I mean it's 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 okay, but it's not. I don't know, not not one of the best. I feel like, uh, but this one really does give Bates a, a big chance to to stretch his acting muscles and and flex his wings. And man, <laughs> <laughs> you sure I'm editing? This? You want to edit this one? No. I, I, I feel like this. Oh, <laughs> oh. Uh, so this one, I, I had actually seen this one before, but it. One I've only seen once before. It's been a very, very long time. So when I sat down to watch it, a lot of it was, I don't want to say a revelation because it's been a long time. I, I mean, I, man, <laughs> I'm going to leave all this in. You know what? We're going to totally get rid of this whole veneer of what it's like to be a, a, a podcaster of, well, between you and I, what we've got a good 18 years in us. Yeah. <laughs> Combined podcasting man hours, years, something. I'd seen this movie before. I watched it again last night. That's just what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So I was excited to kind of revisit it. Uh, I was I was thrilled when you picked it last time around because uh, I knew I'd have an opportunity to revisit a movie I hadn't seen in a long time. But I knew a little bit about. And Martine Beswick's been kind of on my brain a lot lately just because she uh, appeared in our friend Joshua Kennedy's House of the Gorgon. I've never had a chance to meet her. Have you had a chance to meet her? Yes. She was part of the Hammer uh, Monster Bash that I went to a few years ago. I couldn't remember if she was one of the ones there. Yep. Yep. I met her, uh, Carolyn Monroe. There's two others that I'm blanking on right now. <laughs> but yes. Uh, well, uh, Veronica. I think. Veronica well, you Carlson. And I both, you yes. know, we both met Veronica Carlson. Yes. She was at the Monster Bash last year. But uh, Martine Beswick was great to meet. I actually interviewed her. She was just a lot of fun and a neat person. Martine Beswick, obviously, you've got some more experience with her in terms of the movies you've watched over the years. And we'll get to that, of course, during another segment that we do here on the show. Uh, Ralph Bates, we've seen quite a bit. And those are really the two people carrying this movie. Yeah, there are some other characters kind of around the characters that these two play, but I mean, it's Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. In this one, do they call him Jekyll or Jekyll? Jekyll. They do call him Jekyll. So yes. whenever we call him Jekyll, we're we're not necessarily wrong. To be safe, I'll just call him Henry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, 1971. S- Sister Hyde. Sister Hyde, man. <laughs> Shock. After shock. After shock. After shock. After shock. After shock. Warning. After shock. After shock. The sexual transformation of a man into a woman will actually take place before your very eyes. Dr. Jekyll. And Sister Hyde. <gasps> An unnatural laboratory experiment transforms the brilliant young Dr. Jekyll into... <laughs> Sister Hyde. At last, free to enjoy all my cravings. A man by day. <laughs> a woman by night. The perfect disguise to indulge a lust for sex and violence that terrorized all London. Ah! This warning to parents, be sure your children are sufficiently mature to witness the intimate details of this frank and revealing film. Dr. Jekyll. And Sister Hyde. An American International Pictures release in color, rated PG. Was he a woman? Was she a man? Or, or were, were they, they both? both? See Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. <laughs> Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde came out in 1971 in the UK and then uh, the following uh, April 72 in the US. Slightly truncated when it came out here. They, they cut some material for the American release. It's since been restored for worldwide distribution, but uh, there was some nudity that was removed for the American cut. And and really, we're kind of lucky we got any nudity at all, and that sounded a lot more <laughs> sleazy than I meant it to be. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about Martine's attitude toward the nudity in the film and, and the journey she went on. I'm kind of curious which version of that story that uh, you want to talk about. I've heard a couple of, yeah, my sources here uh, have a couple of different versions of that story and, and we'll get to it. This is uh, 71. So this is a different Hammer Studios at this time uh, than what most people think of when they think of Hammer Horror. Hammer Horror, you know, we think about the gothic trappings, the Bray Studios, the Cushing, the Lee, the Frankenstein's, the Dracula's. This one does have some of that gothic-ish light stuff happening in it, but not nearly as much as as previous films from the 50s and 60s. And I think part of it's because it's all shot on sound stages. There's very little location work, if any at all, here. It's all shot on Elstree, on two studios. 
or two two stages, excuse me. And th- there's just not a lot of openness to this movie. Everything feels enclosed. I mean, even the outdoor stuff in the n- night in the streets, it still feels like a set. It, it feels like I'm watching a stage of some sort. And you know, this this is kind of indicative of what's happening with Hammer and horror in the 70s. We've talked about some other products and, and movies that have come out of Hammer from the 70s that were not horror movies. Man About the House. And <laughs> <laughs> I think it's – and a few people have made this comment as well. It's, it's pretty telling that the two movies that were in production pretty much at the same time, this one and then On the Buses, On the Buses, which is a comedy and I believe an adaptation of a TV show – got a lot more money, a lot more attention, and did a lot more business than this film did. Even though they're being produced pretty much simultaneously on Elstree, they were even sharing some production staff, not you know, like cameramen or anything like that, but a lot of the PAs and such were kind of running back and forth doing both. And On the Bus has just got a lot more attention and money and focus. This one could have been bigger, and I feel like if they had opened it up a little bit bigger, it might have done better in the, in the box office, if that makes sense. But anyway... Well, I wanted to go back and touch upon a point you were making, how this has some of the trappings of a, of a gothic, but then again, not. And the, the biggest thing for me, where I don't see this as much of a, of a gothic horror film, and it's mainly in my mind, this one reminds me a lot. I mean, they, they're taking a lot from uh, the lore of Jack the Ripper yeah. in, in a lot of this. And I, in, in my mind, I equate that closer in history to us than gothic history you know where the gothic where frankenstein and dracula would be running around in the hammer cinematic universe and i agree it does feel a little they've advanced it a little bit yes you mentioned jack the ripper this movie tends or, or feels like it's trying to take three different distinct stories two from history one from well robert lewis stevenson uh, the Jekyll and Hyde story, the Jack the Ripper story, and then let's throw in some Burke and Hare as well. Why not? A point that I uh, was not aware of, that Burke and Hare was based on real-life activity, which I did not know. Now, I think, and I'd have to double-check, because we were talking before we started recording and we talked about Burke and Hare. There is some Burke and Hare, if not flat-out appearances, at least some references or allusions to Burke and Hare in previous Hammer films. I believe we have some grave robber types in at least one of the Frankenstein films. Oh, yeah. At least, yeah. So there's going to be – and, you know, there was a Burke and Hare film that came out a little bit ago with uh, your guy in it, Sean, Sean of the Dead, that oh. guy. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> you know that guy. That guy. What is going on? Why can't we think of it? <laughs> Blanking on his name. Simon Pegg. Yes. <laughs> but is, isn't that supposedly like a dark comedy? I wouldn't be surprised because it's it's him and... Um, Not Frost, is it? No, it's Cla- uh, uh, Claw. Oh. Um, Andy Serkis. Andy Serkis, yes. Probably not having nearly as much fun as he did as Claw and Black Panther, but... Anyway, uh, the Burke and Hare murders were a real thing that happened in the 1820s or so in Scotland. Uh, 16 or so confirmed uh, murders committed over a period of about 10 months. And they would sell the corpses to a doctor for medical stuff, uh, anatomy lectures, that sort of thing. And which, which is kind of common. I mean, if you go back and look at the history of medical science, especially surgical science, surgical medicine, the idea of cutting up bodies for things it wasn't really accepted. It was kind of frowned upon for a long time. So people like Burke and Hare saw a need. They were doctors who wanted to learn. There you go. There you go. And and I like how they played that into this movie because Dr. Jekyll needed some uh, bodies to experiment on. And, you know, his first uh, idea was to go to the morgue and he was, um, you know, getting some there. But uh Basically, they couldn't keep up with his demand, so he uh, was put in touch with uh, Burke and Hare, and uh, they were supplying him with um, some ladies of the evening that they would um, that they <laughs> street would, walkers street walkers. Yes, they were uh, they were killing and bringing to him. So, what is interesting though is that even though Burke and Hare, even though it was a real life thing, Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Jekyll and Hyde did write a short story, did write a story called The Body Snatcher, inspired by Burke and Hare. So, you know, I'm sure Brian Clemens, the writer of this film, saw that and decided to kind of bring that in a little bit too. But it's still, 
I don't know if I've seen Jekyll and Hyde and Burke and Hare mixed together like this before. No, I thought it was a, a, an interesting thing to do. Like I said, I was watching the, the film with Tracy. I didn't know the story of Burke and Hare. When their names were mentioned, Tracy's like, is that the same Burke and Hare that was, you know, of history that was doing grave robbing and killing for medical reasons? And it turns out that they're making reference to them. Kind of neat, I suppose. You know, gives it some more uh, reality, maybe. Yeah, grounds it a little. Yeah, yeah. And then the Jack the Ripper stuff, which Jack the Ripper I've seen pushed into so many different horror stories over the years, uh, both in film, TV, literature. I, I, a few years ago, several years ago, there was a, a license from Universal Studios Frankenstein novel in which Frankenstein's monster meets Jack the Ripper. So, I mean, Jack the Ripper shows up everywhere. <laughs> Jack the Ripper went into outer space and hooked up with, with uh, Scotty and Kirk and Star Trek. I mean, it's oh, all over. That's true. I forgot about that. Played by the guy who did Winnie the Pooh's voice. Which Ster- is Ster- Sterling Holloway. <laughs> Sterling so, Holloway. <laughs> so weird, man. <laughs> oh, Bob. No, wait. I'm sorry. Not, not Winnie the Pooh. I'm sorry. It was Piglet. It was Piglet. I'm oh. sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah, not get, sure who get, was the voice of Piglet, if, but Sterling Holloway was Pooh. Get your Disney right, Derek. Yes. <laughs> Don't you know who you're podcasting with? <laughs> Brian Clemens, we mentioned, uh, I mentioned as the guy who brought this to Hammer's table. He is somebody that I really like for something else that he did with Hammer. And because I'm editing, I'm going to go ahead and put the cue in right here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is one of Scott's absolute favorite movies. And if he's not careful, I'm going to say that's the next movie we're talking about next time, even though we've already done it once before. I want to do it again. <laughs> now, Brian Clemens was uh, the man behind Captain Cronus Vampire Hunter. But he had a huge television career prior to any of this. He was working on The Avengers, not Infinity War. Let's fight <laughs> Thanos Avengers. Uh, but but the, the TV series The Avengers, which I've seen very little of, admittedly. I've only seen the movie based on The Avengers, which was horrible. Oh. Why? Because <laughs> I didn't know Why, it was so bad. Scott? I watched it when it was oh. new, when it first came out. Did you see? Oh, man. <laughs> Isn't that the movie or one of the movies that Sean Connery's like, yeah, I'm done making movies? Pretty much, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So he was involved in a lot of television and went to Hammer with this. And let me see if I can find it. Well, are you looking for the uh, the, the information from Hammer Film Legacy from Quatermass to Devil's Daughter by Wayne Kinsey about the, the lunch where they were come up with this idea? No. Yeah, from that book, they uh, said that uh, Roy Ward Baker, who directed the film, and Brian Clemens were having lunch at Elstree. And they were discussing what could possibly be done uh, with classic horror characters that hadn't already been done. And uh, Baker uh, was thinking and Brian suddenly burst out laughing said, I've got it. I know what happens. He drinks the magic potion and turns into a woman. And Brian Clemens added that Jimmy Carreras was a couple tables away. And I went over to him and said, how about Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde? Clemens was then invited to uh, Carreras' office a few days later and he said, I went up to Hammer House in this creaky old uh, elevator, and when I opened the door, there was this poster, and I hadn't even written a word yet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, knowing what we know about how Hammer worked, not surprised. Not surprised. <laughs> not surprised at all. Uh, so often they would do posters and publicity material before the film itself was ready to go. I mean, famously, The Mummy was that yeah. way. So I'm looking here in uh, The Hammer Story, The Authorized History of Hammer Films by Marcus Hearn and Alan Barnes. Brian Clemens says, he pitched to Carreras on the back of an envelope, a free and fresh adaptation of the original classic, a story to fit any period or modern day. Jekyll changes from a powerful man into a slim, beautiful, full-breasted woman, and yet he retains his male mind and his male drives and his male strength. Jekyll uses Sister Hyde as the perfect disguise. He roams the street like Jack the Ripper, seeking out his victims, and they are easy to find, because why should they fear a woman like themselves? <laughs> okay. I can definitely see where some of that was used in the movie. Yeah. Not all of it, though. Clemens then prepared a treatment that said it during the Whitechapel murders in the 1880s, and there was a 17-page document that was turned in, and here's some brief snatches of dialogue he included in the treatment. 
This is what I'm going to do, resolves a furious hide. I'm going to kill that fancy-faced Susan, kill her and have Mark for myself. And then Dr. Jekyll will be blamed, but he won't be anywhere to be found. Oh, okay. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> I have some quotes about Beswick and, and her uh, response <laughs> and involvement. Now she got involved. Uh, I don't know if we want to go that far. And I, You know what? Let's talk about Beswick. Why okay. not? She, she's our, our leading lady, the hammer glamour. And it's the 70s, so Hammer's not shying away from the nudity. Well, before they hired her, they were having trouble filling that role. They had somebody else in mind. Carolyn Monroe. Yeah. Was originally a thought of, but they hired uh, Bates really quickly to play uh, the Dr. Jekyll part. But they were having trouble filling in the, the role of Sister Hyde. According to Hammer Films and Exhaustive Filmography by Tom Johnson and uh, Deborah Del Vecchio, they went as far as uh, placing an open letter in UK trade papers that read, The part of Sister Hyde is going to make whoever plays it the personality of 1971. The guidelines are quite simple. We want the most beautiful girl in the world. <laughs> Martine Beswick had been living in the States for yes. a long time up, up until this point. She had actually been married to John Richardson, who uh, had been in a previous Hammer film. I believe it's the same guy I'm thinking in a movie that we absolutely adored here on the show. The Four-Sided Triangle? Um, now, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Seven Arts present the most spectacular woman in the world. She, the immortal goddess whose passion defies time. She, whose cruelty defies description. She, who waits for one man to drown the fires of the longing burned within her for 20 centuries and across the desert of lost souls over the mountains of the moon to the venal city of Kuma. At last he came to bathe with her in the flame of eternal life. She who must be obeyed. She who must be feared. She condemning thousands to tortures beyond your wildest imagination. Frolicking in pleasures beyond your strangest dreams. She overpowering adventure in color. Oh. I'd rather watch the four-sided triangle. <laughs> hey, four-sided triangle is actually pretty good. Actually, it is. It is not a bad movie. No. Uh, John Richardson is the blonde in that. Uh, and he and Martin Beswick were in the States. She came back over to the UK for something. I'm not entirely sure what. I'd, I'd have to double-check my history. But she had done some work for Hammer before. She was in a movie that we've talked about here on the show before, uh, One Million Years B.C. She was in something else for them. Slave Girls. Decided to stop by Hammer, and there's everybody, and it was like, hey, it's Martine, and then she kind of fell into the role, which is kind of cool. Yep. Yeah, I also, I don't know if I believe this, but uh, when they hired her, Roy Ward Baker uh, stated that nobody realized how much Ralph Bates and Martine Bestwick looked alike until they uh, showed up on the set for the first time. See, some of the stories that I've read are that they brought him in and had him stand next to each other. And it's like, oh, my, they look so close to each other. Let's yep. just do that, you know. So I, there's a, some confusion, some – well, some of it's misinformation, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. And I don't know if it's because, again, it's not one of the Hammer, Dracula's, Frankenstein's, one of the big movies, one of the movies that made a big splash. I don't know. I mean, there's definitely a um, resemblance between the two. Oh, yeah, no question. And and uh, another thing that I found interesting uh, back in the uh, Hammer Films and Exhaustive Filmography is that Ralph Bates actually uh, uh, felt he lost half his role, jokingly stating that, uh, I wish I'd played both parts. It could have been the original Tootsie. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph Bates is an interesting cat, man. He was a good actor. Really yes. good actor. And I don't know if we talked about this before. I know it's kind of sidelining a little bit. But, you know, Ralph Bates' involvement in the movie, uh, not only did he get to play a role, but, you know, and have a job and get paid. He also got a wife. Uh, Virginia Weatherall is in this film. She plays one of the uh, street walkers. <laughs> this was how they met. And he killed her in the film. <laughs> and, and he says, she was the first lady I killed. And the relationship has been going steadily downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like Virginia Weatherall is somebody that we've – somebody we've talked about either here on the show or on MKR. Maybe I've talked about – oh, I have talked about her on Monster Kid Radio because she's in The Crimson Cult or The Curse of the Crimson Altar. And I like that movie a lot. But she did some other hammer work too. Anyway, uh, let's see. Martine Beswick. She is fun. I've had an opportunity to talk to her as well uh, in a less official capacity than you. 
Uh, in the Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde press book, she had this to say about her role. Sister Hyde is incredibly blatantly sexy, loves men, revels in being a woman. That's how we all dream of being. Every woman's fantasy is to be a wife in the kitchen and a whore in the bedroom. <laughs> Any girl who denies this is lying. Wow. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, any female listeners of 1951 Down Place, what do you think? <laughs> if there's any still listening. <laughs> yeah, right? I didn't say it. Scott didn't say it. The nope. Kidney Stone didn't say it. That was Martine. <laughs> that, that's, or supposedly. It's the press book. So, did she really say it? You know, it's the press book. You know, that stuff. The, the Ballyhoo and the promotional material. Who knows how accurate that is? I mean, Hammer is in the business of, of selling their movies before making their movies. So, who knows? Yeah, I don't think you would see any movie studio promote their film with that line today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Roy Ward Baker. He is the director of the film. Uh, he is uh, a solid hand at uh, Hammer, as well as uh, uh, at Amicus and a few of the other British studios. I mean, he is somebody who's familiar with what they do. Well, he also did one of your top five. The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, baby. Uh, you know, he discards a Dracula vampire lover. So, I mean, he was a solid hand there at, at Hammer. My understanding is that they weren't really sure who they were going to get as the director for this. It just kind of settled on Roy Ward Baker. I think Sangster was looked at at one point as a potential director uh, on this. But, I mean, Baker is... Well, there's one other uh, movie I wanted to mention that he's uh, one of my top fives. Okay. He did Quatermass in the Pit. Yes. <laughs> so Baker, Baker's good. I, I, I don't uh, – let me cushion with what I'm about to say with, with some praise. I like what Baker does and the movies that he does I've always enjoyed. But when you think of Hammer directors, I don't think I don't go to no. Baker. I, I go to Fisher. I even go to Sangster even though he didn't direct a lot for them. He was more of a screenwriter. I, I just – I don't go to Baker even though I know Roy Ward. Baker directed a lot of Hammer and Amicus and a few other things here and there. He directed the Monster Club for Amicus or the studio that – Kind of sort of was amicus. Uh, good stuff, but I don't – I don't know. I wonder – I can't help but wonder what this movie would have looked like in Fisher's hands. Mm, more, probably more gothic. A little more open, yeah. perhaps. Do you want to talk a little – speaking uh, – go on with uh, Martine Bestwick and talk a little bit more about the elephant in the room? Let's do it. <laughs> Martine Bestwick talked about um, that being an early problem on the film when she, they got around to filming the first transformation scene. Uh, Roy Ward Baker insisted that Bestwick completely disrobe during the scene. And she is quoted as saying, I totally agreed to what was in the script, which was bare breasts, but no full frontal. Then I got on set at, and uh, Roy Ward Baker told me, I don't want to have to shoot around your panties. I then asked for a closed set, but Roy pulled another trick on me. There was dozens of people hanging from the rafters, but I did the scene anyway. After all the problems the shot caused, it was eventually cut down to a brief view of her breasts. And that's from the Hammer Films and Exhaustive Filmography. That's pretty much close to everything that I've come across uh, looking into a lot of this. There seemed to be some hesitation about it from her. And, and I get it. If it's not in the script and not what you signed on for, it can be awkward and uncomfortable, exploitive and all of that. And, and I totally understand. Some of the material that I've read seems to indicate that it, it was in the script and, and she kind of sort of knew. But to go full frontal just seems ridiculous. I didn't realize they went full frontal, that they actually didn't have to shoot around, or, yeah, did not have to shoot around the panties. I don't. Well, so I don't know why you would do that. I read a quote also in um, the Hammer film Legacy from Quatermass to the Devil's Daughter that stated that she ended up uh, not fighting with Roy Ward Baker about the full frontal because she realized that you know somebody becoming a woman for the first time would want to be naive and want to explore and make you know everything. So she, that's why she finally agreed to film the full frontal that they didn't actually use. And here's a quote from her. Hammer, we're pushing for full nudity, even though it wasn't in the script. Roy and I stopped speaking for a while, and then I turned around and said, this is silly. 
let's just stop this. So I agreed to strip off for the scene where Sister Hyde is revealed. I understood that it was extremely important for that scene because she's birthed and she has no shame. Yep. Roy and I came together and worked it out, and he was cool after that. Uh, that comes from Hammer Glamour uh, from the author and historian Marcus Hearns. That's where I did I, read it from. Yes, that's the yeah. quote I was thinking of. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I I don't know, man. Is it necessary for the story? I mean, I guess I get the point. I I suppose if you're a guy and you suddenly wake up a woman, that might be one of the first things. That, I mean, if you're a heterosexual, you know, guy, or even not, I mean, just to kind of say, like, really, did this just happen? You know, th- it's, it's going to feel different, I'm sure. I, I guess I would go back to, you know, if, if that happened to me, I would want to verify that it happened everywhere. Am yeah. I, it, was it just, you know, waist up? I, I could see where you, where that somebody might think that is important. I, I got from what they ended up showing in the film. I got enough to to know. Yeah, he's a woman now. I I didn't need to see uh, downstairs. No, I didn't need to either. And and I I think haven't we seen movies where somebody has changed genders and, or changed sex? Excuse me. And you know we we have the shot where they pull the front of their underwear out and look down and then look back yeah. up at the mirror and go. <gasps> You know, that sort of thing. We don't need to... Ha- or they grab themselves above the clothes. Right. And you don't need to see it. I mean, right. granted, these el- these examples that we're mentioning would have been played more for laughs than yep. anything else. But we didn't need to see it. I mean, we see the hand go down below camera. You, you, you got it. Yep. You got it. I think one of the shots of her bare breast where her hand has changed was probably unneeded. Yeah. They, they could have communicated that differently. And it's not like Baker wasn't trying to do some more subtle things too. Like during the first transformation downstairs, we have the guy look at the cuckoo clock with the or the yeah the clock with the man and the woman yeah. on it, and we go from the man being in the light to the woman being in the light. I mean, there's some things happening here on a more subdued, restrained level that we didn't necessarily need it. But it's also Hammer of the '70s, and they're trying to make a buck. But Martine's not comfortable. But that's in the script. I, I don't know. It's it's a mess. I don't I don't know if it was needed, to be I'm honest. Did, I, I'm glad they didn't do it every time. Oh man, that would have been a mess. It, it almost I was worried she was going to. It had been a while since I'd seen it. Like I said, I only saw it the one time. So when she's I guess kind of seducing his buddy, the professor, I expected her to disrobe again though, for him to turn around and there we go, here's the full show. I expected that uh, when she was on the couch with the upstairs neighbor, that there would have been a um, a nude shot there. Yeah. And we do get like her behind at one point. Yeah. So we do see that too, but I mean, and we're not prudes. We're not saying we don't, you know, it's just, I don't know if it was needed for this, but I mean, it's a different time in terms of what they're trying to sell. Not trying to justify it, just it's kind of, I don't know. It would be interesting to see the original American cut. Yeah. I think I would have easily been sold just on her performance alone that she was no longer male. She was total female. There is so much confusion in her face when she first looks at herself in the mirror. I mean, I get it. Yep. Yep. And we know, I mean, it's not like the title is hiding what's about to happen here. We know. Well, it's on the the poster. Yeah. yeah, it's on the poster. You're going to see the transformation of a man into a woman. But then again, like I said, I from her performance alone, if you'd have taken out the the shot of her bare breasts, I would have been sold at the transformation. Agreed. I, I I think she she sells that transformation. You know, I mean, it just looks like Ralph Bates is in pain, but when she is on the on the screen and taking over the transformation, she sells it a hundred percent for me. She does. It's it's solid work, man. I mean, she's a good actress. She's, she's very good in this. She's really good. In this. this is my favorite of the three Hammer films that she's done in terms of her performance. And Ralph Bates is great, too. Yes, I, he is. I know you said it looks like he's in pain all the time, but I, I get it, man. 
his insides are getting rewired and reworked. I mean, the, the interior of a man and woman's body, there's a lot of differences yeah. there, man. You know, well, so things I, I are just, changing. When I said that he's in pain, I meant during the transformation scene. Oh, I see. Okay. The rest of the time, I think he's great. I mean, he's, he's, oh, yeah. he sells me that uh, he's trying, you know, at the beginning, he's trying to, to solve all viruses, you know, come up with antiviruses. And I'm sold that he is a driven person wanting to do that. Maybe sometimes a little, you know, jumping at the wrong things because when his buddy tells him that he won't have enough lifetime to to do all this, he doesn't take stock and say, okay, these are the ones maybe I should focus on. He drops all that and focuses on, okay, I need to extend my life so I can right. do all this. Yeah. But no, I think he's great in this film. I, I liked him in this one more than I liked him in uh, Taste of Blood of Dracula. I think it's a solid film, a solid performance from him. I mean, it's easy because I feel like some of the other performances are kind of one note. Yeah. And maybe that was by design. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. As you said earlier, uh, Bates and Best would carry this film, and everybody else is pretty much one note. I mean, you've got uh, Professor Robertson – who is um, Ralph Bates, I guess, best friend or maybe former mentor. I'm not really sure of the relationship there. But um, the professor will stop by and just check on uh, Dr. Jekyll and see what he's working on. And and he's the one that gives him the advice that you're not going to be able to solve all viruses in your lifetime. But then again, he, he seems, for lack of a better term, he seems more like a dirty old man in this movie. You know, it, it, I wouldn't say for lack of a better term, he's got this kind of, man, I kind of look at the relationship of, uh, Frankenstein and Paul from curse of Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of get that kind of vibe in terms of their relationship, but the minute a pretty girl walks in front of him or walks by him, all of that changes. It, it doesn't matter what he's talking about or what they're working on. It's like, oh, I see. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Look at it. You know, it's, <laughs> I have no idea what that was. <laughs> but I mean, he really does have that kind of vibe. And it's, it's, it's kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> it just feels gross, man. I don't know why. It just feels awful. Um, this is not the first time, or excuse me, this was not the only time he appeared in a film with Jack the Ripper themes. He actually appeared in 1988's Jack the Ripper hmm. as well and, and played Dr. George Phillips in that. I don't know if I've seen that film version of Jack the Ripper, but uh, yeah. Michael Caine's in it. I thought it was interesting that uh, Professor Robertson was kind of the, I don't know if he was on staff or being paid by the police, but they always went to him every time there was a murder. Yeah. So suddenly, I don't know, are they trying to do, there's a little bit of Sherlock Holmes feel to it. You know, yep. get, the, get the professor, get the, get the guy who can help us out. The, but of everybody else in the cast, I think he had the biggest part. I mean, we do get to meet the upstairs family and they're the, the son and the daughter are involved, but they seem more like, much more like side characters than anybody else in the film. Yeah. I did mean, we mention the actor's name who played Robertson? Gerald Sim? Gerald Sim. I don't okay. remember if we did. I want to make sure I mention that. Right. But then you've got Louis Fionder. Fionder? F-I-A-N-D-E-R. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Uh, he's an Australian actor, and he is one of the uh, downstairs neighbors. He's the upstairs. brother of— That's the, right. Downstairs. Or, no, I'm they sorry. were upstairs. He, he was Howard Spencer, the the brother. That's right. He's upstairs. That's right. Upstairs. You're right. And then— and uh, he, People might know him from like Dr. Fives Rises again, another 70s British horror film he was in. And then you had his sister, um, no, his mother, uh, Dorothy Allison. She was playing I, Mrs. Spencer. That's right. And she, she'd had a pretty long career as well, been uh, active from the uh, 40s at least, up through the late 80s. And then um, Susan Broad, Broadnick? Broderick? Broderick. Sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> who played uh, the sister, Susan Spencer, uh, who um, falls in love with Dr. Jekyll. For some reason. For some reason. Yeah, I didn't quite buy that either. 
but they're there to set up a dynamic for um, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde because they both seem to fall in love with uh, the brother and sister. It's so weird, man. I anyway, uh, Susan Broderick to me is the weakest of the cast. I agreed. Agreed. And I, I can't tell if it's her or if it's the role because the role seems very, Oh, it's Dr. Jekyll. I'm going to invite him to dinner and then throw a fit when he turns me down. She reminded I, me of a, of a, like a 17 year old. Oh man. Not, not yeah. a mature woman. Yeah. Not that, Maybe there is some mature 17 year olds, but she seemed a little flighty because she would turn on a dime sometimes. I'd be curious to see her in Countess Dracula, which is another Hammer film she did in 1971 with the great Ingrid Pitt. I don't know what she does in that film. In fact, I don't remember if I've ever seen Countess Dracula. Dominique, please forgive me. Um, but (laughs) (laughs) um, she's in that as well. So I'd be curious to watch that and see how she compares. But yeah, the, just the part seems to be she's written there to be danger. That's it. Yep. To be in danger. Excuse me. And, and the rest of the cast are either streetwalkers or police officers. Yeah. I, I wish I had like more information about some of the cast here. Uh, the only th- other thing that I was able to pick up is that uh, Paul Whitson Jones, who plays one of the police inspectors, apparently Sar- was on Sergeant a, Danvers. He was uh, on a children's TV show. Uh, in which his character's name was Fishface. That's about all I got. <laughs> and and that I'm I'm kind of reading between the lines to kind of put that together. I don't really know. <laughs> so, yeah, that's about all I got. Um, yeah, I, I I feel like because of how this movie did and where it kind of sits in the Hel- Hammer legacy, it's hard to find a lot of material on it. Do you have anything else before we move on? For my James Bond connections this time around, uh, we've got... Da, 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 da. <laughs> we, of course, got Martine Bestwick. Sure. Uh, she was in 1963's From Russia With Love as Zora, a gypsy woman. And I think she's got that exotic beauty that I could see you know, she, playing a gypsy woman. I, I think oh, yeah. It, it, I think she, that was a good casting there. I think she is very beautiful in that exotic way. She's she's high up there on my list. I'll just say that much. <laughs> I, I can see why Joshua Kennedy refers to her as Mrs. Kennedy. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that, man. Yep. Uh, she's also she also appears in 1965's Thunderball as Paula Chaplin, a Bohemian MI6 contact. Can I ask you about that before we move on to the rest sure. of your James Bond? Is this the first time somebody's come back? A woman has come back for multiple James Bond films? Uh, no, Outs- outside it's, of like Money Penny and that sort of thing. No, it is it is rare. The first two movies, there's uh, and I'm blanking on the character's name right now, but there's a woman that James Bond uh, meets in Doctor No when he does his first Bond James Bond. He he says it to a specific woman at the table, the gaming table, and then he. Uh, has a one night stand with her and then she comes back in the second movie and he has a little fling with her. So no, Martine's not the first one to come back okay. as different characters. Well, no, the, the, that maybe it's different characters. Yes. But this, the, the first two is the same character okay. that I can think of. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, next up I have uh, Dan Meaden, who was the town crier in Dr. Jekyll and sister Hyde, which I thought was a neat touch. The town crier coming through and announcing the murders. Yeah. Uh, he also appears in 1993's non Eon production of Never Say Never Again, where he plays a casino bouncer. I saw that in the theaters. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> Not together. We weren't together at the time. No. Uh, and then finally, uh, Rosemary Lord, who plays Marie, one of the uh, women of the evening in the film. She provides the narration for the 2000 documentary Inside a View to a Kill that was featured on the uh, initial DVD release release of that James Bond film. (laughs) Wow, okay. (laughs) Uh, For Disney connections this time around, I have uh, Dorothy Allison, who was uh, Mrs. Spencer. Uh, She played Mrs. Canty in a series of Prince and Pauper stories that were featured on The Wonderful World of Disney in 1962. And again, Rosemary Lord, who I just mentioned uh, doing the voiceover narration for a James Bond um, short, (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> not a stretch at all. Not no. a stretch at all. Okay. <laughs> uh, she did some um, ADR work for Disney on the 1996 live action 101 Dalmatians. Oh, okay. So she was still working in the late 90s. Right on. And uh, now we're going to uh, bring in our friend Don Falco with our um, Doctor Who connections for Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. Hello, all. This is Don Falcos with Doctor Who Connections for the Hammer film Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, 1971. Didn't have to search very far to find some strong Doctor Who connections for this film. Uh, Louis Fiander, uh, who played Howard Spencer, played Trist in the fourth Doctor story Nightmare of Eden. Neil Wilson older policeman, played Sam Seely in the third Doctor story, Spearhead from Space. Paul Whitson-Jones, who was Sergeant Danvers, appeared in two Doctor Who stories, as Squire Edwards in the first Doctor story, The Smugglers, and as the Marshal of Solos in the third Doctor story, The Mutants. And Philip Maddock, who was biker, had roles in four Doctor Who stories. He also appeared in the film Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD, which, of course, starred Peter Cushing. There were a few other connections as well, but these are the strongest. And this has been Doctor Who Connections with Don Falcos. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate uh, the work on that, especially some of the names Sometimes Doctor Who names I have the worst trouble with. So one time I miss Casey, kind of. Kind of. (laughs) Maybe I could do it. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, well, maybe. But I didn't think the kidney stone could read. I just. Oh, no, I can't read. Because you don't have any eyes. I have no eyes. I'm not sure how I'm hearing you or even speaking, but. (laughs) We really need to set up like an email address for, you know, Casey's Kidney Stone at <laughs> Really ought to make that the mascot of the show somehow. Just, you know, really market that, you know, we'll monetize down place for the Kidney Stone. <laughs> oh, man. Does, does Casey even know we do that? <laughs> I have no idea. I haven't talked to Casey in a little while. I know he's been busy, but I don't know. <laughs> <sighs> Anyway, <laughs> where were we? Ah, we thank you, Don. <laughs> thank you, Don. Yes, and um, sorry you got brought into the kidney stone conversation. <laughs> I have no idea what just happened there, man. <laughs> the movie, when it came out, it was released as part of a double bill. I believe it was one of the Mummy movies it was released with, if I remember correctly. I believe you're correct. Um, would it have been uh, Blood of the Mummy's Tomb? I, I seem to remember that one because I have not seen that one. So, yeah. And this is the last time Hammer would do a Jekyll and Hyde story. Uh, they had actually done a total of three, including this movie. Previously, they did The Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll, which I believe we did do here on the show. That is correct. Yeah, just releasing that. As well as a movie called The Ugly Duckling from 1959. It was done as a comedy. If it's not lost, it's not easily found. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess, you know, the changing times at Hammer, I feel like on the one hand, we get some great movies out of the 70s and sometimes they just kind of don't hit all the marks. And, and I don't know if that's something they knew going in because like I said earlier, they didn't pay a lot of, well, put a lot of money into this compared to on the buses. I don't know. But let's talk about the movie. Let's. What, what do we think? What? What did you think? What did I think? That's what people want to hear, right? What did the kidney stone think? (laughs) Well, before we do that, there's one other technical question I'd like to ask you since you are the soundtrack guy. What did you think of the music? Well, the music was okay. Uh, It's by David Wedeker, who uh, you might remember from Vampire Circus, which I really like. Of the two, I think I prefer Vampire Circus better. But I thought the music was okay. Um, I do feel like every once in a while it had the possibility of going – a little too far, not like less for a vampire far, but just a little too far. I don't I, know if that makes sense, but I really like the opening music, the yes. music that plays under the opening credits. 
Yes. That's great. Yeah, the opening theme, whatever that is, that's fantastic. Tracy actually um, said that music sounds like something you would hear on Main Street USA at Disney. It's that kind of turn of the century, and it's not downbeat. It's She's like, it, it could fit there, which I thought was an huh. interesting comment. I, I could see that, and I, huh. Or more specifically, I could hear that. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to imagine because the whole thing is on a set anyway, which a lot of Disney is, a yep. lot of sets. I I could totally see that. That would be like the background music you'd hear walking through the Disney does Jack the Ripper ride or whatever. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I, I want to ride uh, that yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> Disney, Disney turns a man in front of it into a woman right in front of your very eyes. <laughs> Sorry, Marching Biswick. Anyway. <laughs> but no, I, I really like that song specifically, the one that was played at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I want to go back and listen to it again. <laughs> Darn. Darn. <laughs> so we, we've got that opening and, and it, it starts, man, you know, we don't get overly in depth with the plot anymore on the show. Uh, and, and it's probably okay because... I feel like the the story here, the plot's not overly complex. I think where a lot of the uh, work went into the screenplay were in the subtle things that I mentioned earlier. Like, let's cut to a statue of a woman. Let's cut to the clock with a man and woman taking, you know, changing shapes. You know, let's that that's where not changing shapes. I'm sorry, changing positions on the clock. I think that's where a lot of the real work went into in the screenplay. The rest of it's kind of. There's a guy and a girl and there's some formula and there's some body, the body snatchers and boy, I'm really downplaying the movie and I'm not meaning to. <laughs> yeah, the, the plot is, is is really simple. You got a doctor that's uh, trying to make up some vaccines. His mentor tells him he won't live long enough to be able to, to do everything he wants to do. So he changes gears. He's trying to come up with something that will uh, extend his life. And he realizes that women live longer than men usually and they don't lose you know they they stay younger looking so that he figures there's something in female hormones that will um, <laughs> extend life that's his thought so um, I, I, I can I interject sure their skin is so smooth yes. and velvety <laughs> really dude okay I don't know how many women Brian Clemens has known over the years. I guess he worked on the Avengers, but yeah, uh, because women's skin is so smooth and velvety, obviously they, uh, you know, they retain their youth longer than men. He basically needs women parts (laughs) for his experiments. So he, um, Starts off by getting him from the morgue, then he hires Burke and Hare to get him some bodies, and then uh, he eventually decides to do it on his own after Burke and Hare are um, killed. Well, one's killed and the other blinded. And um, his experiments end up, instead of making him live longer, it turns him into Sister Hyde, who then there's a, a battle between the two of them for control of the body. Is this the first time, at least it's the first time I think I can, I've seen how they came up with the name Hyde. I th- yeah, I thought that was interesting. He's confronted by the upstairs neighbor uh, who had, um, her brother had seen the woman in the apartment and this one, uh, the, the upstairs neighbor already had a thing for Dr. Jekyll. So she was all upset. They see, they see each other in the hall where he, and he picks up his newspaper and uh, she's, she's all upset and he says, Oh, that's my sister. And he looks down at the paper and there's a headline about Hyde Park. And so she, he says that her name is, is Hyde, and that's where the name comes from. I don't know if that's the first time, but I, I thought that was cool. It's the first time I remember seeing it or being aware of it, and yeah, I thought it was pretty cool too. But in a nutshell, that's pretty much the, the plot of the movie. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of back and forth and, and kind of gaining control, which is kind of the, the trope, I guess, the, the story of Jekyll and Hyde, right? Once, right? once Jekyll signals the initial transformation, maybe the second or third, eventually Hyde starts taking over on his or her own, and there's the internal struggle. And what I really liked about that element of this movie, with the exception of probably not needing the boob shot, 
I really thought the camera work was well done here, yes. showing the transformation. We don't have like a morphing or uh, or like a lapse dissolve or anything like that. It's all done in shadows. It's all done in mirror reflections, setting up a mirror a particular way to angle so you can have both actors or, or, or the actor and actress on set. And, and, and it just it looked really good. I thought it was very, very well done. And I like the idea of the hands being the first thing that he notices or she notices as transforming back and forth. I Just so, really neat. I thought the hands were really well used where you would see the face of either Martine or Ralph, but you would see the other one's hand in front of them. So you've got the female face and a male hand or vice versa. I thought that was really well done. Yeah, very cool. And and that's the one shot I keep referring to. We've mentioned a few times. The first time Hyde is revealed, she does open up her shirt to look at herself in the mirror. And we see Martine's girls. And she's like stroking her face and kind of caressing herself a little bit more than I thought was necessary. And then we get a close-up of just one of the girls, uh, one, one of the breasts, and it's a man's hand all mm -hmm. of a sudden. So first of all, I'm thinking, okay, first Martine struggled with wanting to do or with, with the nude scene to begin with. And now she's got some guy cupping her breast. You know, <laughs> come on. That's not, man. <laughs> Has anybody ever done a Jekyll and Hyde story where it's the other way around? It's like a, a Mrs. Jekyll. I guess it still could be a Dr. Jekyll and uh, a, a Mr. Hyde type. So it's a woman to a man and then back again. That would be interesting. Or just the whole Dr. and Jekyll from a woman's pers perspective. Yeah. Or you yeah. might have a, a prim and proper uh, Dr. Jekyll that turns into a wild uh, Sister Hyde type. But then huh. again, wouldn't that be sort of, um, what was the movie that Eddie Murphy remade? Oh, The Nutty Professor. The Nutty Professor. Yeah, you go from the, the, the nerdy, nebbish kind of, you know, to the, to the, to the ladies' the man. The swinging, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be interesting either way. Interesting take on, on the story here and, and kind of exploring a little bit different differences between men and women, but it's all very surface level because of the kind of movie it is. And we've got all the Jack the Ripper stuff to throw in here too. I don't know if we needed the Jack the Ripper stuff, the Whitechapel murders, fascinating stuff. Oh, especially when you try to pair it with some horror, horror movie ideas. There was a short film a couple of years ago called The Creatures of White Chapel, which is actually really kind of neat. And it takes some of the monstrous characters that we know from Universal, including Dr. Pretorius, and puts them into a Jack the Ripper setting, which is really kind of interesting. But I don't know if you needed that here. It could have just been murders. It didn't have to be the White Chapel murders. Well, I, I like the fact that it was – done the way it was. I'm going to have to disagree with you a little bit because okay. I like I like the fact that whether it's I mean they never really say, you know other than saying the White Chapel murders if you don't know that that's Jack the Ripper it could just be the murders in the area. Right. But I like the fact that they played it up quite a bit that it was a man doing the murders early on which it was. And I like how um, they played with that in the movie how Dr. Jekyll realizes oh I can't go out and do this anymore and get the raw materials I need, but Sister Hyde can. And how they they turn that a little bit, especially there's the one scene where two streetwalkers walk out of a bar, they're a little tipsy, and one of them's afraid of the other one, you know, walking off into the dark alone, and they see Sister Hyde standing across the street, and they're worried at first, and they realize it's a woman, and so they let their guard down. I liked that scene quite a bit. Okay. And so I like how they, they twisted that a little bit in the story with Dr. Jekyll realizing Sister Hyde could go out and do the murders because women would let their guard down. Okay. I, to be clear, I didn't actively dislike it. But my concern, I guess my issue is that it, it didn't need to be Jack the Ripper. It could have just been anything, any, any murderer. As long as it was being done by a male because I, I wouldn't want to lose that – Oh yeah, I, I agree. I just it just felt like one more mythology to kind of put on it. I don't think it took away from it. I I, I don't know. It just seemed like a little bit much. And, and to have Burke and Hare thrown in there too, which again interesting. And I and I think that when these elements have turned up in previous Hammer films, Frankenstein films, I don't think they ever call them Burke and Hare. 
So it was interesting to actually just call them out this time around. Yep. It took me a, a beat or two, probably longer than it should have, to realize that um, the blind guy that we see later on is actually, and I don't know which, if it's Burke or Hare, I just thought it was another character that was out in the streets begging. And it took me a little while to catch that too, though. I don't feel bad. <laughs> 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 I had struggles with that too. I had no idea. So, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but go ahead. I, because yeah. he, he's the one that, and finally makes the connection between Dr. Jekyll and these murders because they saw with the cadavers that they were getting for him, he was mutilating the bodies the same way these murdered women are being mutilated. So I liked how he was kept in the story even after you thought, okay, one was hung, one was blinded. They're, we're not going to hear from them anymore. So I like how he was kept in the story. There is some interesting construction here in the story, which I feel like does kind of harken back to the previous Chuckle and Hyde film. It's kind of sort of told in flashback. I mean, he's leaving notes and yeah. and that sort of thing, and he's kind of confessing. So there, there's not uh, – I don't know what the word is I'm looking for right now. It's early still, folks. <laughs> um, ah, I can't remember the word. It's Tarantino popularized this in modern – pop culture where it's not all in order non non-linear that's the phrase i'm <laughs> looking for i need some coffee or some female hormones i don't know <laughs> oh god just don't lay eggs in your um little glass <laughs> um area <laughs> i thought that was clever i, did I thought too. that was clever when the, the first like oh next time you can try it with a man well this was male well then how did it lay eggs yeah we're talking about a he's using basically a, a fly because they have short lifespans right and he thought he had a well he did have a male and it was now what they have normally a day but he had like several weeks on it now so you got a little science lesson yes <laughs> not as, not as over the top as it sometimes can get with uh Jack Arnold Universal films, but you know, I had a little bit of science. <laughs> what did you think of the movie? I really, really like this movie. Yeah? Yes. Right on. To the point where I would probably change my top five. Holy cow, really? Yes. And that's specifically on the acting of Martine Bestwick and Ralph Bates in this movie. I was totally sold on what they were going through and enjoyed every moment the two of them were on either one of them on the screen. They were, they weren't on the screen at the same time. That would have been a little difficult, but wow. Yeah. Where, where would you put it? If you, it would probably right now, my number five is scream of fear. And I think I would probably put this at number five. I like this one just a, a hair better than that one. Wow. I'm, I so really, I'm... really liked this movie a lot. I'm, I'm flabbergasted and surprised for two reasons. One, Scott's changing his top five. And two, I went to the website to try to pull up his top five to see where things go. And the website came up really fast for me, which is an anomaly because <laughs> normally the website does not want to open for me very easily. So, okay, so your top five is Quatermass and number one, Horror of Dracula, Quatermass Experiment, Twins of Evil, and Scream of Fear. So you would slip this into Scream of, Scream of Fear, huh? Yes. Wow. Okay. Like I said, it was especially Martine Bestwick. I thought she was amazing in this film and was just totally sold on her being a woman with no qualms about doing anything to get what she wanted. Huh. Interesting. Well, if if we do get an opportunity to meet her at some point, we should make sure we tell her that. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely going to. <laughs> huh. Okay. Well, I, I wouldn't put it in my top five. Okay. I think it's a solid film. I think if we were to, and I thought maybe this might be interesting to do at some point, if we ever run out of things to talk about or just aren't feeling it one month, quarter, week, day, whatever, fortnight. Um, <laughs> If we're not feeling it, maybe at some point it might be interesting to go through and rank the movies we've seen so far here on the show and just kind of see where they go. I know it might be difficult to go through and do, but maybe we use something like uh, the Flick Chart website okay, to just put all these movies in and then see what our top whatever looks like 
and and I wonder where this would end up on on that. Flick Chart's a, a cool little website for listeners who don't know that it, it basically helps you figure out what your favorite movie is by going through and presenting two different movies. You pick which one you like better than the other. And it just keeps track and it just randomly shows you movies. If you didn't see the movie, if you haven't seen the film, you can say you haven't seen either one or this one or that one. It'll bring you another movie. It's it's fascinating uh, that they are able to pull all this data and just kind of make it all make sense. And no surprise, my number one is Creature from the Black Lagoon. But it's, it's pretty cool. So I wonder if there's a way to kind of make a customized list of movies and just have you and I go through it and do it one one time. Hmm. That might be fun. Either for this or maybe for a YouTube thing or something. That might be interesting too. That might, yeah. I'd be up for that. Because I'm curious as to where this would land. I, I liked it okay, but I, I wouldn't put it as high on the list as you. I also don't know if it make it in my top ten. I really enjoyed it. I, I had fun watching it, and I'm, I'm glad to have seen it now. Awesome. Well, I'm excited for you. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, Scott. <laughs> no, I'm glad, man. I, you know, this was fun because it was a movie that I'm not overly familiar with. Uh, so to go back and, and to revisit it was, was great. And I would like to pick up the Blu-ray now. I don't have the Blu-ray yet. Uh, we, I had to rely on a DVD release of this to see, but from what I understand, there is a documentary. I don't know how long it is on the Blu-ray that came out, I believe last year or the year before. Uh, it came out on in November of 2017. Oh, uh, so not that long ago. Yeah. And it's a region two. So you would need to have a, uh, region free. Uh, uh, multi-region player of some right. sort. And, uh, but if you can, uh, can play one, Amazon has the Blu-ray, uh, right now for 1688. Wow. Is that pounds or dollars? Uh, this is on the, uh, U.S. version of Amazon, so it's dollars. Oh. Oh. Huh. Okay. And they also yeah, have the, the DVD, uh, it's also, uh, region two, uh, for five dollars, four dollars and 98 cents. Well, that's cool, man. I, I think it's something I would like to add to my Blu-ray collection at some point. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun to, to have and revisit again and see how it looks and to check out that little mini documentary on there. I certainly would like to know more about the film. That's for sure. Yeah, I would too. It was difficult to find a whole lot about it anywhere. This is Colossus, the voice of world control. Obey me and live. Or disobey and die. This is the dawning of the age of Colossus, the Forbin Project. A shocker, fascinating, says the New York Daily News. A sizzler, builds to high tension. Gene Shallot, NBC Radio Monitor. Razzle Dazzle, Smooth Suspense, Time Magazine. Colossus, the Forbin Project. From Universal, rated GP, all ages admitted. On the whole face of the earth today, there is no place more terrifying than the Valley of Guanji. In Technicolor. <laughs> Watch out for them, a menace never known to man or beast before, an endless horde of crawling, crushing, gigantic creatures, so horrifying there was no word to describe them. Watch out for them, watch out for Warner Brothers' screaming new shock sensation, them. Yes, I saw them, they were huge and scaly and they had gigantic jaws and, and then one came at me. <laughs> Kill one and two take its place. This is the endless onslaught of them clawing up out of the earth from mild deep catacombs. See them. The most astounding journey into terror ever taken. Starring James Whitmore, Edmund Gwen, Joan Weldon, and James Arness. Them. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. Once again, thank you for being here. Thanks for downloading the show. Thank you, if you do this, and I hope you do, for sharing the tweets and retweeting the Facebook posts, and I think I got that backwards. Uh, but you know what I mean. Thanks for spreading the word. Thanks for being part of some sort of informal, unofficial, virtual street team by spreading the word of Monster Kid Radio far and wide. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you. Thank you for just being part of this amazing community. Jeff Polair calls the group that comes in to watch the Monster Kid Movie Club movies, especially on Tuesday when we do sci-fi, the Astro Monsters. I don't know if I'm going to call you Astro Monsters. I don't know if I'm going to call you the Monster Kid Radio family, the Monster Kid Radio heads, as Kenny says. I'm just going to call you my friends. 
thank you so much for being here and being part of the show. If you want to know anything about Monster Kid Radio, about this episode, about anything we talked about in this episode, anything in any of the previous episodes, go to our website. MonsterKidRadio.net is where you're going to want to go. You're going to find links to everything that we've talked about. There's even some Amazon affiliate links. And this is a way you can help the show. If you want to pick up anything from Amazon that you've heard about in this episode, please consider clicking on one of these Amazon affiliate links. It doesn't cost you any extra. It just takes a few pennies out of Jeff Bezos' pocket and puts it in the Monster Kid Radio coffers. It's just part of our Amazon affiliate program. Also, I did some research, and this came up in the Monster Kid Astronomy Club last night. Well, Tuesday night, I guess. I'm recording this on when Anyway, this came up. My understanding is that for it to quote unquote count toward the Monster Kid Amazon affiliate link, the Monster Kid Radio Amazon affiliate thing, you have to click on the product that you want after you go into the Monster Kid Radio, I'm going to call it the umbrella. So unfortunately, if you load up your cart, then log out of Amazon or back out of Amazon and then go back into Amazon using one of those links, that doesn't count toward us. If you want to help us, you've got to go straight through our affiliate link. Now, if there's something that you want from Amazon that's not available through one of the Amazon affiliate buttons in the show notes, I'm going to make sure there's a link available for you to just click on to take you straight to Amazon. I'm going to make it super easy for you to help us out. If you are an Amazon shopper, we appreciate all of your support, of course. Also on our website, you're going to find all of our contact information. And Monsters in the Machine, wake up, do your job. Let the people know how they can get a hold of us. You can call and leave a voicemail for Monster Kid Radio at 503-810-5MKR. That's 503-810-5657. Or you can send an email to the podcast. MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com is the email address. That's monsterkidradio at gmail.com. After what happened Tuesday night in the Astronomy Club on Twitch, I probably ought to be nicer to all the machines in my life. We had some difficulties, some technical difficulties, and the movie sit and play as planned, which means next Tuesday in the Monster Kid Astronomy Club, we're going to be showing the movies that we were going to show this week. It's going to be a couple of classic, and I mean super classic, robot films, a couple of foreign films. One's Russian, and I believe the other one was German, if I remember correctly, uh, as well as the silent film The Mechanical Man. It's some good stuff, some real classic robot films that we're going to be showing. And that's over on Twitch. Just look at Monster Kid Radio on Twitch. Go to twitch.tv slash Monster Kid Radio. You can find us over there. It's on Tuesday. The pre-show starts at 3.30 p.m. Pacific. The movies start at 4 p.m. And then at 8 p.m., Jeff Polaire and I start talking about a Star Trek episode. And sometimes these streams actually turn up on Facebook under the Monster Kid Radio Facebook page. Now, this Saturday, that's the big day. On Saturday, we show classic monster movies. 11 a.m. is the pre-show produced by Scott Morris. You know, the guy you heard earlier in this episode. And that runs for about an hour. And then at noon, I come on and I show a bunch of monster movies. And that goes till at least 7, 8 o'clock at night. And this Saturday, it's Bela Lugosi Films. Now, I can't show things like Dracula or anything like that. But there are some really good public domain and obscure Bela Lugosi films that I'm going to be showing, including a silent film called daughter of the night we're going to be showing that this saturday as well again pacific time 11 a.m for the pre-show noon for the actual movies and more often than not kenny even prepares a special famous monsters of film land look video style for the stream so check that out What's coming up next week on the show? I don't know. I don't have anything lined up. I don't have anything in the can although i did put out a feeler message today on facebook so uh you know who i hope you have gotten this message and gotten back to me at this point and hopefully we can maybe even get it done for next week we'll see but i'll come up with something just come back you know same podcast channel same url same whatever i think that's it once again thank you for everything monster kid radio listeners are the best podcast listeners in the world until next week, Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Ska Surf. That song is owned by the band Los Javelin. You can find it on their album Cocktail Caracas. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes. You can go straight to their Facebook page to learn more about the band, or you can go to their record labels page on Bandcamp, which is at greencookierecords.bandcamp.com. Pick up the entire album. It's only six euros. Check it out. Let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name is Sarah Kim Cook. I'll talk to everybody next week. Ciao. (laughs) 